right. So uh, next up, we have Piotr, and he will be speaking about hypervisors being enabled directly in the firmware. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about our story, uh, how we enabled a uh, small uh, Bertrand hypervisor in uh, in firmware or added it as a payload to Corb. So, my name is Piotr Krull. I'm founder and embedded system consultant at 3M Dev. It's a Poland-based uh, embedded system consulting company. I'm a huge fan of open source firmware, uh, interested uh, about platform security and trusted computing. So you can reach me on various social media. Uh, feel free to ping me if you have any questions related. So what we, what we will talk, uh, talk about, a uh, little bit of introduction and terminology about the hypervisors. I'm not a hypervisor researcher, so I will not give you a PhD level talk uh, about that. Uh, I hope that some basics are already known. Um, I will talk a little bit about the bare flank, uh, what it is and what it tries to address. Uh, and then we will go to, to hypervisor as a payload in core boot firmware. Mm, little bit demo. Unfortunately, uh, we have to stick to MP4 uh, recording. Uh, I forget a power supply for, for my motherboard, but um, if you will be interested to see that live, I would be glad to show you that this is not any fake and <laughs> we're not, not just making some uh, video uh, cheats. Uh, and then uh, I will tell you a little bit about the issues and, and further work that we plan to do. So what was the goal? The goal was to create a firmware that can uh, start uh, multiple um, applications in isolated, isolated virtual environments. Um, and uh, what, why we did that? We did that mainly to improve our hypervisor full and to learn more about the hypervisor since uh, there is market demand for that and uh, to understand what kind of capabilities various uh, hardware platforms have. Definitely um, silicon vendors expand um, support for virtualization pretty fast. We have uh, VTD, VTC, and probably we'll see a lot of, lot of more uh, virtualization related features uh, in future. Okay, so maybe some definition. This is very kind of uh, just to start. So virtualization is the application of the layering principle through enforced mo modularity, whereby the exposed virtual resources is identical to the underlying physical resource being virtualized. So, um, so this layering is kind of uh, a single abstraction layer. Um, so, uh, example of the um, of the of this virtualization is like um, we have um, we have, uh, for example, memory which we want to uh, somehow expose uh, higher, and we have uh, unified layering for that. So, virtual memory variety is kind of way of layering. We layering um, we exposing physical resource which is disk in a little bit uh, different way, which is right. Um, so we can see either bigger or redundant uh, array of disks. Um, and this, this is, this is the, same, the same concept. Uh, and enforced modularity, modularity means we, the, the person who see the things from, the, from top of that layer cannot get through and see what is below. So the virtualization gives us, gives us that isolation. <coughs> So VM is uh, is the abstraction of complete comp compute environment. Hypervisor is a software that manages those VMs. Uh, so uh, we will speak about the various types of hypervisor, hyper hypervisors later. And virtual machine monitor is a portion of hypervisor which is just responsible for uh, CPU and uh, memory virtualization. So full hy hypervisor also contains I/O uh, management. Okay, what types of hypervisors we typically have? So type zero is not official uh, name. It's very unofficial, I would say. We are uh, most frequently play with type one and type two. So type two is, uh, for example, VMware uh, or Oracle VirtualBox or QEMU, how it works. Uh, simply in operating system, we have uh, some module uh, or even this is purely software. And uh, we just uh, run hypervisor and it can run some various OSs inside. Other model is uh, type one hypervisor, uh, where we, uh, and for example, Zen is type one hypervisor, or Hyper-V, or VMware ESX. Um, 
where we just uh, bare metal run um, the hypervisor and inside we can run various op uh, operating systems. Uh, if we're talking about uh, type zero hypervisor, which we can call tree and web visor, which we develop and other uh, IBMs or L4. And this means that we have firmware inside which we put a uh, hypervisor and then we just run from that point uh, OS. It is used in embedded env environment frequently. Okay, a little bit about the uh, embedded hypervisors or embedded bare metal hypervisors uh, on the market. So it's not, it's not so um, old technology, I would say. Uh, it's relatively new to the industry. Um, uh, it started to be used in, in 2000. It is used in mission and safety critical applications. Uh, we saw that in robotics, uh, in automot uh, automotive, in medical industry. Um, so what it gives us is a strong isolation for, for example, non-critical and critical computation. So let's say we have uh, two virtual machines, uh, one doing some critical computation, uh, which is very important for us to, so the application perform correctly. And other, if there will be any failure there, we don't care, uh, which we will simply recover from, from that point. Um, also, uh, we saw applic applications where we have uh, fault, uh, fault detection, so one VM doing for kind of one com calculation and other VM reverse that compu uh, computation. And if it sees some difference, it start to um, claim that there is some fault and uh, take decision to, let's say, uh, run some security procedure or some recovering procedure. There is also need for running uh, uh, legacy code. So for example, it may uh, happen that um, that we have um, some legacy code, uh, but we want to move on with new features and we cannot simply change that legacy code. So because of that, we just uh, isolate legacy code in, in um, some VM, giving it resources that it needs and uh, the new features we are adding in separate VM. Also migration from the unicore to multicore system is simplified thanks to that um, because, because uh, we can scale thanks to uh, virtualization. Manageability is other uh, embedded uh, hypervisor feature, which uh, hypervisor gives, gives us layer for managing those virtual machines, checking its states, maybe updating them. And thanks to that, we have more features on the platform. Also, uh, I saw that cost, cost saving can be a factor uh, because um, this, thanks to um, running multiple um, Multi, multiple isolated applications on one SOC using just simply driving the interfaces to given VM, we can move system which is um, distributed on various microcontrollers to one system which is on one chip and this, this saves cost. So how it looks um, in, in firmware? This is, this is what we built. So we have uh, CPFS, uh, a typical core boot boot phases, which is boot block, ROM stage, and RAM stage. And from RAM stage, uh, as a payload, we created a uh, 3 embed visor or bare flank uh, payload, uh, which creates a hypervisor. Then this hypervisor can run various VMs. For example, in one VM, we may have CBIOS. In other, we have like arbitrary payload. It can be some ERTOS or um, we can also use Grab or Tyanocore to boot operating system. Okay, what is Berflank? So Berflank is a light, lightweight hypervisor written in C++. It is managed by Azure Information Security. Um, it supports Windows, Linux, and uh, UFI, and, and from now also Core Boot. Um, it supports uh, mostly Intel, but uh, the structure of the code is prepared to support ARM and AMD. And those, that support is planned in the future. Um, and most important features of that, it's, it provides uh, memory management support. It has serial support, uh, libc++, also um, vCPU management and uh, VM, VMX logic management. So uh, typically, how you use Berflank is a kind of framework where you scaffold, uh, uh, where you scaffold uh, your own hypervisors and then you develop uh, correct uh, VM uh, exit handlers to support various operations. And uh, Berfrank was created for 
um, interception um, and kind of uh, security research uh, needs, I believe. Uh, and because of that, it's a little bit different use case than we apply it, but uh, that's, that's caused some uh, future um, assumptions, I would say, or design assumptions. Okay, so what we, what we really built. Mm, there is VMM code uh, delivered as a C header. It is generated by Berfrank uh, SDK, you can say. Um, the bytecode is, um, is put, we put bytecode into this VMMH. It's 88,000 lines of code, but it doesn't matter. It's just bytecode. It's 1.2 meg uh, without any customization. So it's like out of the box, we're getting 1.2 meg. We created Berflank driver, which is minimal C code, um, which helps us uh, hook um, uh, hook everything to la launch uh, virtual machines, and it contains like um, uh, it fully contains uh, around six thousand six thousand lines of code. Uh, it required lib payload modifications because lib payload, which is required to build a payload, was just thirty two bits and we had to extend it to support 64 bits. Um, and and uh, other headers we had to import from Berflank projects because we use functions from there. So the tree looks like, like you see here. Uh, it's inside uh, core boot projects. Uh, it's on our GitHub. You can use that, uh, compile, and, and test. OK. Um, so typically, uh, Berflank uses OS API. Um, if you use it as a type two, because Berflank can be used as a various types of hypervisors. Um, if, if you use it as a type uh, type two, it uses OS specific API. If you use it as type one, it uses, for example, UFE, UFE boot services. Uh, but of course, when we using uh, a core boot without UFI payload, we don't have UFI boot services. So we have to extend um, a, a lib payload to, to, to add support, some support. So we added support for 60, uh, 64 bit. Uh, we added 64 bit uh, exception handling, um, and of course, the, we didn't care too much about the device drivers. This may still require some some fixes. So we had some size problems uh, because um, um, because we just have to. If we boot some VM, we just have to have something inside SPI. Uh, we don't want to use disk for loading additional. Um, bootloaders or, or anything else. So we want to have everything in SPI. And of course, we need uh, some additional stuff like CBIOS. Uh, the, the hypervisor have, have to be there. Also, we need core boot there. So it happens in, and we have just eight megs. So we ha had to compress some stuff to, um, to enable that. OK, what other problems we have? One of the problems was that um, Core boot tables are not modified by uh, by lib payload. So so core boot tables describe memory map, um, and and then this memory map is reused by, uh, for example, by uh, by CBIOS. So then we run payload, uh, which is our bare flank hypervisor, and then lib payload just allocates some memory for example for uh, for VMM. Um, and if if it if then um, CBIOS and of course lib payload do not modify core boot tables to indicate that that memory was allocated, and then when we jump to virtual machine and try to use CBIOS, which of course use core boot tables, uh, then we can have problem because because that memory can be already corrupted. So uh, how we how we fix it that uh, first of all at the core boot level during the build we reserve some memory for uh, VMM. Uh, and this memory is just reserved over whole uh, whole time, and then uh, yeah, that's 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 that was the main fix. Uh, so the compilation time it should be solved by a runtime solution, but we didn't have uh, enough time to apply that. Other problem that we faced was that uh, VMX uh, is, like VMX extensions uh, have to be run on all cores. Because if we if we have situation if one of the core does not uh, run VMM, um, then it some software which is there can corrupt the memory, uh, and we face the situation we didn't know what's what's like, what exactly going on, um, and after some time realized that uh, that at some core um, at four core we have we didn't run the um, extension and because of that uh, we corrupt memory of other 
uh, VMs or even VMM. So, um, so we had to implement in lib payload uh, MP code that, that gives ability to uh, say, okay, run VMX on, on this core, on that core, and on the other core, and remember to run on all cores. Okay. Um, so I mostly told you about that, but there is other solution for uh, for this problem with core boot tables. Um, uh, of course, we can uh, use EPT, um, but but the problem is that uh, of course Berflang contains some support for that. Uh, but the problem is that uh, there was also a lot of things that you had to additionally implement to manage uh, EPT correctly. Um, and uh, of course, this would have a significant, imp a significant impact on uh, hypervisor size. And we cannot uh, approach that because we have limited the SPI size. We have just this 8, eight meg and we just couldn't, get, couldn't add that. Um, yeah, and it can be no suitable, suitable for embedded hypervisors because, because of the space uh, limitation and probably performance. So how uh, the payload look like and what, what is designed, uh, what, what the components it has. So as I said, we're starting with, with, co with core boot and we have Berflang payload. Inside we have this uh, Berflang driver, uh, BF driver, and uh, BF driver contain a uh, lib payload, uh, which provides uh, us support for entry point, for the 64 bit, for some memory management. Um, of course, we need CBFS uh, functions to read to read CBFS and uh, get any uh, bootloader from there if we want to run VMs. And yeah, and of course, we there, there is payload loader there. And there is this logic like uh, we first load VMM, so we load. Uh, on, on the course that we want to run, uh, VM. Then we start it uh, and we start payloads inside given, um, given VMs. The, the other problem that we had to, hear, uh, to solve here is the switching from 32 bits to 64 bit, and then if needed uh, by payload, switching back to 32 bits. For example, CBIOS is 32 bits, so we have to switch back. And this, this kind of game had to be implemented. Okay, so maybe uh, I will try to describe what's going on with, with the demo. Uh, okay. So what you see here uh, on the, on the top left, you have um, you have serial console of uh, of the platform of the Mino board. Uh, that we used for development. And you will see that we will uh, boot Berflang. It will boot Berflang as a payload from core boot. So we boot in core boot. So it's, I, I know that it's very hard to see, uh, but believe me that there will be uh, Berflang here. And yeah, and Berflang right now starting uh, VMs, like four VMs, one on each core. And on one VM, we see it, it starts a core info payload. So this, this is just basic payload of, of code boot with just show processor and its features. Uh, you can also see that we have some memory reserved. Uh, this is, this is um, a memory uh, reserved for VMM. Yeah. So um, on the other core, we start uh, Linux kernel, uh, which we want to show that after booting this Linux kernel, we can, on the same machine, have access to Linux, which is, of course, we don't have serial output. Uh, we also didn't manage to enable any, any video, video output, uh, but we run some, um, some um, you know, service, which will show that, uh, that it, this, this VM really works with Linux inside. Okay. Yeah, we can have various uh, we can have various payloads use it.
Yeah, we put the Linux kernel in SPI Flash as well as in TMFS. So this machine does not require any additional storage. It's directly from SPI Flash. Yeah, there is not a lot of the space, but still something. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so also this, of course, on this one core with limited memory, this Linux boots quite long. Like it's, it takes like 40 seconds. Uh, but this is, this is, this shows that, uh, Exactly on that machine, uh, we have um, uh, we have running Linux, and we can telnet to it, we can SSH to it, and we can even uh, yeah, it, we can even run other uh, other stuff. So um, so we we just build those two VMs, one with core info payload, and other with Linux kernel. And I believe uh, on this video we have also some inception. Yeah, so you can see that it was pre my presentation was also run inside this Linux. Okay, anyway, uh, let me close that. Okay, this is description of the memory layout that, that we used. So on top you will see VM1, how VM1 see the memory. Uh, so it's C, uh, core boot tables, uh, some some reserved memory which is for VMM. Uh, uh, it see other area of reserved memory which is uh, really a copy of the um, uh, of, of of the core boot tables uh, to present that to the second VM. Um, and uh, fourth region is um, ACPI, uh, PCI, and and all that stuff. Uh, of course, uh, there is no sophisticated device management and um, exposing those devices to VMs. So if those devices together will try to talk with hardware, probably everything will crash. Uh, but anyway, it is possible to implement uh, that in hypervisor. And second VM, which is um, uh, which is our Linux, um, sees the memory a little bit different. And this is this third line. Um, it's just see that the beginning is this uh, this copy of the of the original area, um, so yeah, and and things that this uh, um, so also it is in the same place in the same place you see VM VMM reserved memory, so this is mainly like that. Uh, so what we would like to do with that uh, in future? So first of all, the problem is that Berflank is built completely uh, as a separate project, and you have to deliver. Uh, Mm, components of that projects or artifacts of that building to the core boot and then uh, do, it do it manually. Uh, we would like to integrate uh, Berflank, Berflank building into core boot. Um, uh, so uh, some configuration right now, we have almost no configuration. Every everything is hard coded. So if you want two VMs uh, in that configuration, you just have to manually hard code that. So of course, this needs some customization. Someone would like to have three VMs or four VMs with various other payloads or for various other uh, applications, then of course this the configuration have to be extended. Um, the, we should improve definitely memory mapping. Um, so maybe use of this EPT, like flexible use of EPT and leveraging all the features of the platform uh, would be needed. Um, of course, the problem is also that Berflak is very fast moving target. And sometimes there are big uh, code drops, like 60,000 lines of code, and you're just losing uh, your your ground. And because of that, like we uh, we frozen our code base in early 2019. It changed sig significantly from that time, and we would like to rebase on the most recent version. And of course, it would be great to provide support for AMD, for AMD platforms, like uh, AMD getting a lot of traction recently, and we also supporting AMD in on other hardware. So it would be great to enable uh, Berflang there. Okay, that's mostly it. I get through that very fast. So I, I thought that I will get through hardware um, demo. It should take more time, but this is it. So um, is this a bear, bear Frank based on um, existing code base or is this a completely from scratch? Mm. This is so Berflank is a is a scaffolding we can say scaffolding framework for building hypervisors, and this is like clean build of uh, like plus 
our minor mo uh, modifications, but everything is public. Like so it's you, not based on KVN Zen or Acorn or any of these. No, no, no. This is like Berflank is completely other hypervisor. It's like uh, SDK for building hypervisors. Oh, you can building. say. Yeah. Oh, okay. So in this case, uh, if we have application like one VM, one partition, is it also suitable for that purpose? Yeah, I, like I believe, like Berflank uh, is good for for embedded environments. It's not like for general purpose hypervisor environment. Thanks. Um, so I've been having discussions with some people at Intel about. <laughs> And with Patrick Georgi in the past about maybe a more componentized RAM stage that would be loaded as a payload, not a stage. Mm -hmm. Would that be of any help in the kind of thing you're talking about, or is it really not any connection? I was just wondering if we could, if we have more componentized RAM stage, maybe we could build your bare flank stuff in more easily than we do as just a, you know, a separate payload. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, that would help uh, because we already had idea to to integrate that. Into core boot, and I was like, this was internal discussion in 3M Dev, and we argue rather that this would not be approved by core boot community because, like, you know, like how how it would be, and so there was idea to it would be easier probably uh, because we don't have lip payload and all this game with lip payload, and I know there is also idea to have core boot in 64 bits. Yeah. yeah. So, so it, if that will also be implemented, then we will have like two wins at least. How difficult do you think it will be to reproduce uh, something like what you've done on hypervisors uh, that are a little bit more complex, like let's say Acorn or Zen? Mm. We try it, Acorn. Like we, we give it a try, and Acorn is bloated, to be honest. Like and there is service OS, and mm -hmm. like it, 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 our idea was to start from SPI, so like Acorn for sure no. Zen is huge for x86. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on ARM is much smaller, maybe it would be possible to reproduce. Okay. So I know I know other things, like maybe we, we didn't explore all the possible paths for embedded hypervisor. For example, recently I know that there is a work in L4RE uh, project. So those guys probably, if someone from that environment probably can argue that this would be maybe a better solution because more components are ready. Do you know if Berflank will ever support IOMMU to actually separate the hardware from uh, different uh, VMs? Like uh, native, natively, uh, I don't know. Uh, like you always can add that, but it's kind of work, uh, additional work. I, I don't think like they have idea of doing that natively. So because I assume there would be need for driver and some way of configuring. Okay, I want the separation. The question is how it will play with various co hardware configurations. Yeah, we implemented a VTD support in EFI like two years ago mm -hmm. at Apple, and it was really difficult. But when it works, it does work. So it works on almost all Intel systems we have now. And the biggest difficulty was actually get the right people from Intel to tell us how to debug out of things that have like not this there is no documentation for this corner and nobody knows yeah, yeah. so for an open source i am actually i i'm looking forward for somebody to redo the work and mm -hmm. then publish the license for it to be used as a knowledge source because now i would like to have it somewhere and yeah can't deliver mm -hmm. So you know, it would be great if you contribute to that that to open source. But I believe this is a huge value for company. Uh, I did stuff for uh, AMD. Like last year, I have a talk about AMD IOM MMU and enabling uh, on PCNG's platform. And yeah, I I know the pain. Like I understand that. And still, there it is buggy. There we have some f facing some corner cases where people complaining devices not work correctly when it's enabled by default. So um, 
Could you uh, uh, dynamically adjust the memory allocation? For example, if uh, one VM needs a large memory, another VM needs a less memory. So could you, uh, you know, dynamically adjust the memory for each VM? Yeah, like uh, not dynamically, like not in a way, in a runtime. Like we're doing that, it's hard coded. Like, we this have is to reserve uh, the memory for each VM in the beginning and then yes. change after that. Yes. Okay. Like you cannot change runtime, at least in current implementation. So that means that in the beginning, you have to know the requirement for each VM about the memory. Yes, use. that's normal requirement for embedded and embedded environment. So in embedded hypervisor usage, typically you know what VMs you want, how many of them, what resources they need, what devices they need, and uh, this is like predefined environment. Okay. I have a few questions, and I apologize if I missed it, and if it was already in your presentation. Um, the first was, um, I don't believe that you th or talked about why you you chose bear flank. Because we analyzed bear flank versus Acorn and decided that bear flank fits our ability to customize uh, okay. to to our needs, and it's small enough. We can build hypervisor small enough to fit in Got SPI. It. Okay, thanks. Um, the other question I had was, I, I, you talked about other pieces that you were carrying, I guess some patches to Corbett and things like that. Um, or were you putting that in your own builds? Um, yeah, we would we would be glad. Like Berflank building environment is CMake based. Um, and you know, like, I don't know like how, how it will fit into the environment. It also depends on, on demand. Uh, if there will be demand, like we are willing, more willing to Provide that right now. It is integrated on on our core boot fork. Uh, it's open. It's like we don't hide anything. So, um, but but you know, I don't know when it may happen mm -hmm. and in what form. Like because it depends on core boot community decision. Okay. Um, so then, are you carrying your uh, uh, sixty four bit trampoline stub in your bare flank port as well? Uh, like leap payload. Uh, I believe leap payload will be contributed. I don't know if we sent uh, patches already. Lip payload will be comp contributed because there was a work about 64-bit uh, lip payload, and I believe more people can contribute from that. Bare flank, I don't know how many people really can contribute from that work. Uh, like uh, that's why I'm talking this, giving this talk, and to get some feedback if this is really interesting, if this makes sense. But I see quite a lot of you, and I believe it makes sense. Thanks. I missed the beginning of the presentation, so I don't know what is the size of Bearflank compared like to Zeng, for example. Uh, I don't know if we can compare. <laughs> and if we should, this is completely different. Uh, so uh, 1.2 meg uh, VMM um, and 6,000 lines of code of, of, uh, of, of the driver, you can say like the, the heart of the payload. Uh, which 1,000 line of code is uh, lip payload modification to support 64-bit, and 800 lines are just copied from bare flank because we need headers. Okay, because uh, I'm a contributor for the Eds project, and before we needed to exend inside of the SPI flash because of constraint, and with key exec being modified and everything, we don't need to do that. But like Zen was in. Were you SPI. able to succeed with that? uh yeah but trammel did it like trammel hudson like, mm -hmm. it was working so if you want to check because like if you want something that is embedded mm -hmm. and really small and predefined already like uh, your machines that you want and everything like zen seems to be able to be reduced. so how big was zen in that situation it's still pretty big though yeah but i thought it was like two one one meg or something i don't know the, the size constraints of all of this but oh. i was well, questioning yeah. It comes, I think, you know, that's why I was asking. I think it comes with the same set of constraints of like setting up the system just right with the, you know, service VM and you know stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. you know. yeah. So then will require DOM zeros, and and DOM zero is fully featured yeah, yeah, yeah. operating system, yeah. And we don't really need that. Well, 
speaking on, uh, of ARM, I mean, there's actually DOM0 less than now. So like it's all evolving pretty quickly, but you know, that work that he has done, uh, it's still pretty big from what I understand, you know, for the purposes of this yeah. presentation. Yeah. Yeah, Zen was like too big for us in that case. There are, I know that there are some hypervisors coming, uh, which will kind of fulfill those requirements, but they were not available at the point we developed that. We still have 10 more minutes, so take the chance. Yeah, anyone have like a mino board so power supply or something like that? <laughs> I, I just missed my one, and because of that, I cannot show live demo. I would I would just prove that this is real thing, and we can switch. This is quite cool that one, on one side we have on serial, for example, we have payload. It's arbitrary payload of core boot, and on the other side we have fully featured system. Yeah, so uh, it, it, we were also surprised that Linux boot without, to be honest, much work uh, using Berflank. Yeah? Well, we're gonna try and get you one. Okay. Not within the next. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, like, but, sure. But also, if you, if anyone would be interested in seeing that, uh, you know, presented on hardware, I would, I would be glad to show that. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. All right. Then thanks again. Thank you very much. <laughs>